part B of the beginning bioinformatics part two. So I'm going to pick up where we left off at U37. Um, so introducing cut, sort, and unique. And in my terminal, uh, I've already navigated over to the Arabidopsis directory, which is where I finished off. So if you're picking up this video or continuing on work in the, the Bioinformatics Part 2 tutorial, there's no new document to download. I'm just picking up right at U37, uh, where I left off in the previous video. So we've already been playing around with the GFF file. We created a subset file, right? So uh, actually, before I look within that, let's just do LS, right? OK, so we have a GFF file, um, a FASTA file for the proteins, and then this is the subset file that we created, right? We took 5,000 lines off of this uh, original GFF file and then appended that same first 5,000 lines again. OK, so there's 10,000 lines in that subset. Uh, and then there's the, the FASTA file that has the DNA sequence from chromosome one. And then there's an intron file that has the DNA sequence for the introns. <clears throat> so just to look at what the subset or what a GFF file in general looks like. So I did less. And this is a standard format for GFF. It's got nine columns. Uh, it's not important to remember what all of them look like uh, or what's in all of them. Um, at this point, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at these uh, down the road. But the, the first three columns, the first one is um, the chromosome name or the sometimes it's the gene ID, but uh, in this case, I think I have it in the document here. Um, yeah, I, so the, the second file is the source name and the third file is the feature type. I think I actually had a couple typos in here. Um, Originally, this might say that the second field is the gene name. That is not the gene name. Usually this is the program that generated the, the features. Um, again, not we'll talk more about the details uh, later. Um, and you can always Google if you like. For example, bring this over right here. If you want to know the nine fields that make up a GFF file, there you go. Um, I can never, I remember them just by looking at them. I can recognize what's in there, but if you were to ask me to list what are the nine fields in a GFF file, I could never do it. Um, right, that the sequence name, that's usually the chromosome name. Um, and, and the reason it, it's, you know, I'm sort of hedging there is that sometimes you have a GFF file that uh, is only for a partial genome, and so it's not actually listing the chromosome name. It could be listing scaffold or uh, some smaller subset of the genome, but we won't worry too much about that. The first exercise here is to list each of the unique feature types, and feature is not a generic term here. It is specifically the third field in the GFF file. So bring this back over, right? Field number three is the feature. And if we look back at our Arabidopsis subset file here that I have, I'm using less, the third field here is listing different features. So like that line in the GFF is listing the chromosome, it's chromosome one, telling you the start and the stop. So the, basically that's one line in the GFF that <clears throat> designates the whole chromosome. Then you have a gene, messenger RNA, protein, exon, those are features. So what if we want to know what all the feature types are in this GFF file? So we're going to use our cut, sort, and unique to do this in a really efficient way. Cut is going to pull out an individual column or a field 
in this case. Fields are synonymous with columns in the tab delimited file, and it's it's tab by default when you're using cut, but you can also, um, you know, if you have a comma separated file, you could use the dash D and D here stands for delimiter and then specify that you want to separate based on commas. But we'll in this example just rely on cuts default behavior to split on tabs, so it's going to automatically say right this is field one the chr1 and then there's a tab there and then that's field two and it'll split on that tab field three okay so we'll be able to do dash f for field and three to specify that because we know that's where our features are and Right, our question is to list each of the unique feature types, so we don't want to have duplicates. So we're going to use sort and unique. To process the output from the cut. Command OK, so let me quit the less. And. <clears throat> we're going to do cut. Field three. Don't know if you need a space. I could that could be wrong. So I have it here. Here I have it with a space in the tutorial. I'm going to see what happens if I don't put a space there. But we want to run it on the subset. And so the output of that. So this command cut field three should output just that feature list. But we know it's going to have duplicates in it, so I'm going to do sort and unique to give me just the unique labels in that in that column okay so that worked that the f3 does not require a space there it works the same with the space i just wasn't sure if i needed it so it's, right, same output And there, those are all the unique labels or the unique kinds of features in that Arabidopsis subset file. Okay. It's no guarantee that that's all the unique ones if I were doing this on the, uh, the complete GFF, but at least in our subset file, that's all of the unique features. To see what each one of those is doing, you should try running um, the cut command without using sort and unique. And then use it with just the cut and the sort, but leave off unique. And then see what happens if you leave off the sort. OK, so you could pause the video here and try that on your own. That's how you get the, the most benefit out of these little questions after the after the whoops the extra the task but first of all okay so what happens if we take off sort and unique well you get that whole column okay so what it's doing is literally just pulling that whole column out of our subset so that should get should have given us 10,000 lines I don't know if this will work, but I so I'm putting word count number of lines. And so I'm piping the output of that into word count because I want to know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it gave us 10,000. Sure enough. Right, so it gave us one feature for every line in our subset file. So now what happens if we take that. And we use sort. Well, it looks like it sorted our output. OK, 
Okay. How many lines do we get, I wonder? I'm going to pipe that into word count. So we still got 10,000 lines, right? That's what I expected. So we got the same output as just using the cut. Just so happens that now it has grouped the features. Alpha, well, it's not really alphabetical because we have T. Maybe it is. Wow, there's a lot of Exxon ones. So it looks. You will learn not to trust that it is strictly alphabetical, but in this case, it seems to have worked alphabetically. In any, but even if it wasn't strictly alphabetical, it has grouped everything together um, that has the same name. Now, let's try if we, what happens if we will, if we leave out only the sort command. Well, that's weird. We we told it, right, this was the command, cut out that third field, and then do unique. But obviously, I have lots and lots of duplicates here. So what did, in the world did unique do? How many lines do we have? Oh, we have 9,978. So we didn't get all the lines. How weird. OK, it's not really weird. I know what's going on. So when we leave out the sort command, um, unique did not, was not able to just give us the unique answers or the, the unique features. And it's because unique only works on consecutive lines. So in, in order to right, only report something unique, it has to be unique relative to the next line. So you have to have sorted it first so that it's clustered every all of the features that have the same name and then unique is able to get rid of all the copies because they occur on consecutive lines. Right? So when I sort it and then do unique, now magically I get only one instance of each one of the features. So super important to remember, if you want unique to only give you the unique stuff back, you have to sort the thing, sort it first. <clears throat> Number 38 um, is going to use sort to do something numerically. By default, the sort is working alphabetically, sort of. Um, in, in most cases, you can just assume it's doing it alphabetically. Um, I probably shouldn't even bring up the fact that it, it it's not perfect all the time because most of the time it's it's just alphabetical. Um, but so in this one, we're going to uh, instead of doing something alphabetically, we're going to sort by the start position. So you might want to find which features start the earliest on the chromosome um, in terms of the sequence. So. Right, we can do a sort. Um, alpha numerically, so. In this case. We can do cut. By field three and four, so this is going to pull out the. Okay, go back over here just so we know what we're looking at. All right, field three is the feature. Field four is the start position. Let me, 
what does that look like in our in our file? Okay. So field three and field four, it's going to grab the chromosome, or it's going to grab the feature, and then the next field, field four, has the start position for that feature. So I'm going to move things around and make room so you can see everything and so that I can see everything. I guess it's not so important that you see this. You have that or you should have that on your desktop. So I should just make this as big as possible. All right. So we do cut field three comma four to get both of those. We're going to run that on the subset file and then we're going to sort. And again, this time we want to sort field four on numerically, right? So we're going to tell sort to use numerical and we're going to use K. K, I remember it as column. So, and in this case, what column are we trying to sort? This is the first case where um, it, it's really helpful if you can get in the habit of thinking about what does the computer see? At this point, in our original data file, it was column four, but that has now been piped into the sort command. And so what does the sort command see? It only sees two columns. So if we told it column four, we would get an error because sort doesn't have four columns. It only has two. And we want it to sort numerically on column two. OK. And then. I have it in this example giving us just the first 10 lines because we haven't done anything with unique. And so in this case, we would have 10,000 lines of output because we would be uh, ordering these things based on the start position. <clears throat> That's really weird. Oh, no, it's not. So that is correct. And, and so if you're running on the subset file, this should be the way we created it in the tutorial that the um, beginning bioinformatics part two A, this is what your output should look like. Now, it doesn't look like this output. The reason for that is that in this tutorial, all right, this example, I'm running it on the subset file that has the first 10,000 lines, not the first 5,000 lines twice. So how could I make my data? How could I go back and make this, reproduce this output? Okay. So you could pause it and, and try to do that yourself. Pause the video, I mean. Or, well, not or. Head 10,000 on. Uh, forgot the name of the file. AT genes. And I'm going to write that to subset and I'm going to overwrite it. So now I'm no longer going to have 5,000 lines twice. I'm going to have 10,000 unique lines 
in my subset file. OK, now I'm going to use my up arrow to go back in my history and rerun that cut and then sort command based on the start positions. And now I have reproduced that same thing from the, the um, tutorial document. OK. So in case you didn't follow, right, I've written out basically the step by step what's going on here, cut out three and four, and then the sort command, it only sees two columns, so we have to specify column two. And we're going to sort it numerically with the, the dash N option. <clears throat> so task 38.1 says use the tools that we have so far to determine how many chromosomes are in the Arabidopsis GFF file, including chloroplast and mitochondria. So, you can pause the video and try to work on that on your own. Um, think about what have we done so far? So, how did we get the unique features? We cut out field one and then we did sort unique and it printed out how many it printed out each of the unique features. So if we want to determine how many chromosomes there are in there, and we know that field one is is telling us about the, the chromosome names, right? Then it should make sense. We need to cut field one and then do sort unique. And that should list each of the unique names in that chromosome field. OK, so again, you, you can pause and try to write that yourself uh, and then come back and you can see my solution for it. OK, so if we cut field one. <clears throat> and I'm not doing it in the subset, right? I want to know how many are in the Arabidopsis GFF file, not our practice one. OK, so I'm going to cut field one out of the big GFF file, and then I'm going to do sort. And I'm going to run that just to, so I can see that it's working. OK, so I got five chromosomes plus the chloroplast plus the mitochondria. So seven chromosomes. Now, you know, if we were really doing biology here and somebody asks you how many chromosomes are there, most Arabidopsis people would tell you there are five chromosomes, right? So you wouldn't count chloroplast and mitochondria. Um, and then, you know, to just get the direct answer, I would take that output and just count the number of lines. So bam, seven is the answer. Pretty cool, I think. Uh, just a couple more things about sort. You don't actually have to use cut first. Uh, we could do sort straight away. Uh, you can just tell it to sort on um, field four in this example, right? For 
doing this, we could just reorder the output based on <clears throat> chromosome four in the original file without having cut them out first. The benefit again is memory. So if I cut the fields out first, I'm having to process less information. But the benefit is it's a fewer steps. I, I didn't have to do the whole cut process and then work on the, that same number of rows. Sort defaults to the same delimiter. Sort works uh, similar to cut in that the default delimiter is tab, um, but you can specify. Um, in this case, you have to use dash T instead of dash D. Don't ask me, I didn't invent the programs. Um, would have been nice if they would have left it at dash D, but there's probably another option for dash D in, in the sort command. And I give a little example there, right? You can, as you're reading through here, try to think about what, what would that do? sorts numerically on column three and for a delimiter it uses periods <clears throat> that will give you um actually let's just for fun let's try that just to show you how because our, our gff file does have periods in some of the columns I'll do it on the subset file, right? So there are a bunch of dots in here. And, you know, just for fun, dash N K three. Actually, we, we make it an error here. I use single quotes there. I'm not sure double quotes probably work. Whoops. Uh, sorry, I hit typo there. I was trying to say, I think double quotes work as well. Um, how weird. So this should be sorted. I can see that it is sorted by the third column. Right? That's why all the CDSs are clustered together. All the three prime things are clustered together. Oh, that, that line is just wrapping. It doesn't, it didn't really make sense to sort by numerically by column three. I should probably do that by column four, huh? some weird lag happen with <clears throat> forgot to give it the file name there oh strange So this is a, a perfect example of what I was uh, trying to show about how when you split on a strange delimiter like that, like I can't tell what the program thinks is are, are the columns anymore because it used dots to split. And so I can't really tell what the columns, it looks like it's 
you know, things are still in order, chromosome one, and then the mRNAs are all clustered together. But I think this is all the first column, second column, third column. And so maybe it's sorted by the last row here. Yeah, it looks like that's sorted. It's very hard to tell because, you know, this is a tab delimited file that I forced it to split by periods. And so the, actually these um, rows down here, you know, it's actually treating this as a column separate from this. So in any case, um, the, the main point here is you really need to be careful with what you're using as delimiters. Now, most of the time you'll be dealing with tab or comma separated um, files. In the case of GFFs, tab is, is they're meant to be tab delimited, so you can use a comma over here and, and this will all be treated as one field. Where you run into trouble is when people unknowingly use commas in some field, but they also have a comma separated file. Uh, so they want columns separated by files, but then they use a comma in like part of an annotation. It leads to all kinds of, of sorting problems, okay? All right, let's just move along here. Another um, that, that sort of problem with what happens when people put the wrong character and it overlaps with whatever you're trying to use as a delimiter. Uh, it's a good segue to U39 because um, using the right line endings is really important and uh, I'm just going to encourage you to read through this. There's a little bit of history there and a link to why line endings are uh, in a little bit of a messy state in terms of, especially if you're on a Windows computer, um, Microsoft uses what I will say are the wrong line endings. Uh, at least if you're in a Unix, a Linux, um, Unix environment, Mac uses the, the right line endings. I, when I started out in my postdoc, um, we developed some software called CAFE, Computational Analysis of Gene Family Evolution. And those first few years after the software came out, I would say 80 or 90% of the people that emailed me um, requesting help with making our software work in their system or their computing environment, it wasn't the software that was the problem. It was that they had been manipulating their data on a Windows machine, and then they tried to run it in Linux, and their data file had all the all these, you know, you can't see them. They're invisible characters, but the line endings were not being recognized in the Linux environment. And so they, they had to find a text editor or, um, use the TR uh, command to substitute all the line endings and, and get them corrected so that Linux would recognize them. Um, one example uh, or another example is if you get data that's been uh, in Excel and then saved as a comma separated value, sometimes you run into this. Um, so let's look at So this is in the miscellaneous folder. So I'm going to CD up one and then over to miscellaneous. And let's do LS, right? So there's the Excel data.csv. And let's just look at it so you can see. All right, this has been saved from Excel with as a comma separated values file, but it's got everything on one line, like the program less is showing me all of this on one line, but 
if I were to go back and open this in Excel, I would see that this is actually separate rows and it has this caret M symbol as a line ending. But because Linux doesn't recognize it as a line ending, it's giving me everything on one line. Right. And we've already learned, I alluded to it just a second ago, you know, to fix this, we could use the translate. I don't actually know. That caret M symbol might be the slash R. I'll write this. It may just be the way less, the less program shows me that um, backslash R line ending type. It might be, in other words, it might be telling me that's a Microsoft line ending or, or a carriage return line ending. Okay, so what, what did I just type in? I'm using, gonna use translate that line ending. That's pat, the first pattern and I'm gonna replace it with this kind of line ending or this pattern. Oops. And then I have my read file redirect. Remember, this is the alligator eating this file. Okay. If I do this, whoops. Okay. Do not make that mistake. That's the one I mentioned in the last video. That is the right file redirect. This would overwrite the Excel data file and leave me with nothing. So taking that and then I'm going to output Excel data formatted dot CSV. Okay. And I, I, I didn't put a space there, doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, no errors. Let's look at Ta da. Our, now our five little sequences from our Excel file are less is putting them on separate lines, and we don't have any more of those weird caret M symbols. I don't think of yeah. Okay. When we start to do um, Python programming, I'll t I'll probably talk more about line endings uh, because that you know when you're trying to read new files into a program that you've written, that's when you often run across this line ending problem. Um, and when we talk about tech kind of text editors that you use for programming. Um, you definitely have to have your programs written and saved using software that uses the correct line endings. Otherwise, your program won't be interpreted correctly. Let alone your data. All right, so. Last little module in the tutorial is this parsing challenge. And it's really just um, testing, can you put all of these things together to parse the first introns uh, in the five prime UTR and closest to the transcription start site and output the headers and their corresponding sequence in the order of, that of you know, closest to the transcription start site first. Okay, so that may seem like a lot. But uh, I'm at least 
well, I, I, there is a solution provided at the bottom, but don't skip ahead or you won't understand what it's doing. First, let's look at the data um, in that intron. So we need to go back to our Arabidopsis directory. I'm going to use head just to look at the beginning. Let's look at the first 20 lines in the intron FASTA file. Okay, so the FASTA file looks like header row. And these headers have a gene name, the intron position, so intron one. And so, right, you can see this is G. That gene, intron one, intron two, intron three. So that tells us our intron number. The third field in the header tells us the distance from the transcription start site. Now, let me add, there's no way for you to know this without some kind of, like, without me telling you what's in these header rows, right? Header rows in a FASTA file are not standardized in the same way the GFF file columns are. So th there's there's no way for you to have known that that is intron one, intron two, intron three. I mean, you might have guessed it, but certainly no way for you to know that that is 204 base pairs from the transcription start site, 457 from the transcription start site. So you know that this is the closest intron to the start site, so intron number one. And then the last thing is whether that intron is in the uh, CDS, the coding sequence, or in the UTR, the untranslated region. Okay, so all the things that we were asked to use to split this file seem to be present in the headers, right? We know the distance from, or we know that, you know, we can find which ones are in I1. So which ones are from first intron? Which ones are in the five prime UTR? So actually let's, I'm gonna use less just so we can go down. Actually, let's. I don't really know what to grab because I don't know how is that specified if it just says five prime UTR. So I'm going to use less. And okay, there's one. So it is five prime UTR. So for. I just want to check this, 5UTR. Um, OK, so there are lots of them. Right, so I just grabbed it. it. It spit out every line that has 5 prime UTR in it. And a subset of those also have I1. So you could imagine, you know, you could set up the, a grep with a regular expression that has I1 and 5 prime UTR in it, and then you would just get the lines with 5 prime UTR. But maybe that's not the most efficient way to go at the whole thing because we are being asked to extract the sequences from this, not just the headers. Okay. So that was basically me looking at the data to see what kind of information can we extract from the headers to sort of identify which sequences we need. And before we start to think about the commands that we're going to use to actually perform it, we 
or what I'm encouraging you is sort of stop and 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 try to outline your strategy. Okay, so already I've sort of given a few steps or a few indications for right how you might look for the headers that indicate the first intron and the five prime UTR. If we could do that, we would want, then want to take those results and sort them by how far are they from the five prime UTR. So if I did a grep I1 and five prime UTR, I would get a list that had just the lines that meet those criteria, then I could use the sort command to numerically sort on this number that is the transcription start site, right? You have to think a little bit about how to specify that, right? Because we could use the underscores as delimiters for our columns. We could force sort to split this on the underscore. And so that would be column one, two, three if it was splitting by underscore. And then we would just have to sort by that. And if we sorted that, like, okay, so we've done that sort, then we would want to pipe that into, right, to only keep the top five of those, we could just pipe that into head and tell it to only give us five lines. Right. So that gives us a strategy for how to do it. And then you start filling in the, the blanks, like grep lines that have I1 and 5 prime UTR. So, and, you know, I, I often, you know, play with the commands individually, see if I can get the right output. So I want to grep lines that have I1. And then I don't care what's in between. So if we if you go back and look at the part one of the tutorial, um, we had that one where we looked for something that had ATG at the beginning and then some repeat in the middle and then a stop code on at the end. This is a similar situation where I want to find I1, I don't care if it's at the beginning, so I'm not using, right, if it needed to be at the beginning, I would have to do something like that, but I don't care if it's at the beginning. I just want it to match I1 and then something and then 5 UTR. If I wanted to be sure that 5 UTR was at the end, I could put the dollar sign there, but I really don't need to because I've, I've seen all the output for 5 UTR, it's always at the end, so I don't really care. Oh, uh, got to put the file name. Okay, so that worked. I've got only first introns that are in the five prime UTR. Dash N K. Yeah, that's going to be column three, I think. And we're going to have to use the delimiter underscore. And I'm going to go ahead because I, I don't want to see, um, you know, to, in order to be able to tell whether this is really sorted, maybe I should do more than five rows. Let's. 
just to see if it's well, if it's sorting the way I think it should. Let's give this 20 lines. And it looks like it did, right? It looks like these are duplicates of each other, except no, notice that they're in different genes. So the gene name is different. It just so happens that the in the first intron in both of these genes is seven base pairs downstream of the five prime UTR. All right, so in principle, that is the first five. <clears throat> Those are the five introns that are closest to the five prime UTR or the, the transcription start site that are in the five prime UTR. All right, because that that is the distance to the, the transcription start site. So right now we've gotten to this point, we can find the right headers to solve the problem, but that wasn't really the question, or it was only part of the question. We wanted to extract five sequences from that. So we did not get the sequences. So I've given you a hint. Could you manipulate the line endings to carry the headers and the sequences together through the sorting process? What do I mean? Right. In the FASTA file, we've got header and then whoop, header and then sequence. OK, and this is actually. I'm not sure if, that, that, if that's one line or not. But you have header and then the sequence that belongs to that intron and then another one and its sequence and, and so on. That's just the standard format of a FASTA file. You have header and then the sequence, header and then the sequence. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sometimes FASTA files have the sequence all on one line. It looks like this one does not, right? So there are probably line endings that I can't see there. <clears throat> But the hint that I'm giving is I know I can pull out the right headers from this. Is there a way for me to stick the sequence onto the end of this and then pull out those header lines that have the sequence connected to it and then sort of break the sequence back off again? Okay, that, that is one way to solve this problem. And it's the way that I'm right. This is the output ultimately. OK. So I, I just did my history and then reran it. So these are the headers that we know we can get. See how they match. Those are the headers we're looking for, but it's not in the right format, right? We need the sequences to be along with those header rows. And it, I don't really mind if you end up with a, a an extra line break in between the sequences. Sometimes FASTA files have that, sometimes they don't. But this is the output you should be targeting. And I give you the solution. And just show you it does work, right? I can copy paste that and make it work. OK, but you clearly don't learn anything from copy pasting. And you might also notice that I've pretty much used. Well, I don't know, not all of them, but many of the. 
commands in, that we've developed in our arsenal over the last couple of tutorials. That is a pretty complicated and long Unix command or pipeline, right? This this is where the term pipeline comes from, right? I've piped together a bunch of Unix programs to manipulate that file and give me the the right output. Okay. You might want to just write the program in in Python when it gets to this stage. All right, so that's it um, for the second part of beginning bioinformatics. Um, I am going to ask you um, to be able to explain this, right? So it's not enough to just uh, copy and paste that and make it happen. You should be able to write out in sort of plain English, what is this thing doing? Right. First, you're translating the new lines throughout this file into at symbols. OK. Why would you do that? Well, that's what I would like you to be able to tell me. Okay. So work through this, figure out how is that giving me the. This output. OK. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for part two.